Uh, thank you for coming. Welcome. Uh, my name is Penny Wright. Many of you are regulars here, and we're happy to see you when we have some new faces, and so welcome to all of you. Um, I want to mention that if you do not live in our library district, please take a look at what's going on here and take a newsletter and join us for any and all programs. Um, we want to thank the Southampton Historical Museum represented here by Mary Cummings in red <laughs> um, for, uh, for actually making this program happen even though it's here. So we're delighted to partner with them in many ways and today is, is one of them. Um, but we're here to, on this beautiful day, which we planned this way so that you all could take a little hike, maybe a 20 minute hike with Frank afterwards to actually see some birds. But we're very, very happy to have uh, Frank Covedo here, who is the director of the South Fork Natural History Museum, which he has been heading since 2010. And he's going to talk to us about winter birds and then take a little bit of a hike. Some of you may be surprised to learn that much of Long Island and the Northeast are designated as important wintering areas for migrating birds. So we will be informed about which birds visit in winter and we will better understand how they survive. Before he took his position at the South Fork Natural History Museum, Mr. Corvedo worked for 12 years as a bay management specialist, restoring and enhancing shellfish populations of East Hampton Town. Since he took over at the museum, he has added many educational programs and started many important initiatives. Um, he is joined, by the way, by Melanie Mead in the back, hand raised, who is their education and outreach coordinator. Uh, Frank is an avid birder, which is no surprise, and naturalist, and he lives in Sag Harbor. We're so happy to have him. Please welcome Frank Cobeda. Thank you, Penny. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I normally don't do presentations and outreach opportunities. Uh, I'm usually stuck in the office doing administrative work, so this is a treat for me, and it's really nice to see a large group here taking advantage of this opportunity. So, um, anyway, thanks to Melanie for being here. I don't know if anybody saw, but we have uh, eastern tiger salamanders and common snapping turtles at the table. There's also our most updated newsletter. And uh, also a flyer that has a free day pass for all of you to visit the museum in the future. So um, there's two parts to my presentation today. There's the first part uh, is just going to explain a little bit, a bit about the South Fork Natural History Museum, a little bit of the history, and also then get into wintering birds and um, and how they survive. And then I'm going to follow up at the end of this presentation with perhaps a little uh, bird observation at, at uh, Lake Agawam to see if there's anything there. I just went there this morning and there were some mallards and a couple of northern shovelers, but we'll see what happens. Birds kind of come and go throughout the day, so one minute you might have a, 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 a small number of birds and in the next couple of hours you might have a lot. So I also want to point out Mark Goldberg. He was a pro professor of mine at Southampton LIU where I graduated back in 98, so it's great to have him here. So Great to see you, Mark. So winter birds and how they survive. So the facility that I represent is the South Fork National History Museum. It's located at 377 Bridgehampton Save Harbor Turnpike. It's a 6,400 square foot facility that houses uh, various animals and habitats that represent the South Fork of Long Island. Uh, this is a picture uh, uh, in, I think, June, where in the foreground there's milkweed plants in bloom, which are very important uh, plants for monarch butterflies during migration. Um, this used to be the old Bridgehampton Winery, if anybody recalls. It's right across from the Children's Museum of the East End. And it took 16 years for the South Fork Natural History Society to find this property after it was started in a small little nature clubhouse in Amagansett, it took 16 years to form capital campaign um, to buy the, the property and renovate the winery into the state-of-the-art museum that you see here. When you enter the museum, uh, you come to this uh, first floor exhibit area. It's interactive. 
Uh, all the exhibits are, are interactive. There are drawers to open peepholes to look through. There's a four minute glacial video on how Long Island was formed, the geological processes. Um, there's a topographical map underneath the video that shows the aquifers under Long Island. Uh, and the four circular exhibits that you see there on the main floor are all our aquatic habitats that exist here on the south of Long Island. Uh, we have vernal ponds, coastal plain ponds known as cuttlehole ponds as well, uh, salt marsh and ocean aquatic habitats. And there's live animals in each one on one side and then on the other side there's models and plants that represent those different habitats. This is also the, the main exhibit area. We have um, a, an area where we have a harbor seal and the Montauk Peninsula habitat, uh, a rocky intertidal uh, area where um, the seals inhabit during the winter months. Uh, there's also peak holes and draws to open to look at lag deposits from the glacial, the, rec the receding of the glacier, glaciers thousands of years ago. And then there's also peak holes that represent different bird life in this particular area. The downstairs, there's more terrariums and aquariums that house tiger salamanders and spotted salamanders and different types of fowlers, toads, and turtles. And then we have our marine touch tank, which is a very popular exhibit for families to come and interact with uh, marine invertebrates, and it's like such as sea stars and clams and oysters. There's also different types of fin fish in there that the kids can look at. There's uh, killifish and uh, different types of uh, Asian shore crabs and green crabs. Should I hit OK or should I do something else? Sorry. I just want to. I don't want to hear anything. It needs a power cord, So that's our, our, one of our most popular exhibits uh, in the museum. Uh, behind it is a, a new aquaria that we just purchased through a grant um, with Global Wildlife Conservation. There's two tanks in the back there, actually. There's a freshwater tank representing freshwater uh, fish. And on the right side of the slide, there's a saltwater tank that represents our saltwater uh, fish here on the South Fork so very popular. A lot of times when the kids come in, the families come in, they just want to go right downstairs and start touching animals. So it's very popular. And it's overseen by our staff, Melanie, and other environmental educators that are on, that are working on those on, uh, throughout the days or they're monitoring uh, the interactive part of when children are near that exhibit. So and we're open seven days a week, 362 days a year. Is that right? 361 days a year. On the four major holidays. So. We also, the, the property of the South Fork Natural History Museum is a gateway to the Long Pond Green Belt Preserve, uh, which is an 1,100 acre expanse of uh, coastal plain ponds and different types of habitats uh, that is actually beneficial to us because we can conduct interpretive programming in the field. Uh, so we have an observation deck with scopes, uh, some infor information on the panels. Uh, explaining what, what the field is supposed to be doing and, and the history of the field. Um, that area that you see that's low cut is, is called Vineyard Field and it was used for agricultural purposes for 300 years. And after uh, the Bridgehampton Winery lost its funding and we were able to purchase that property, um, the, the uh, CPF funding um, and the open space funds preserved this area and we're trying to bring it back to its natural state, which is called e ecological succession. So it was once a woodland habitat, and when the Europeans came in the 1600s, they cut down all the trees and started farming on that property there. And now what we're trying to do is bring it back to a shrubland habitat, which is slowly taking place, and then eventually get it back into an oak forest, which is what it was originally uh, was the habitat. 
300 years ago. So it's going to take about 150 years for it to become an old forest again. So we won't see that in our lifetime. Hopefully, our children, great grandchildren, will be able to see that in the future. So it's a really um, important preserve for migratory birds, for eastern tiger salamanders. We see a lot of old eagles in the area there, red foxes, turkeys. So a nature preserve is this nature preserve exactly what its, inten its intention is to bring back the natural wildlife. So it's a great place to visit. And that's open to the public. You don't have to visit the museum to enter that preserve. It's open to the public. It's, it's purchased with community preservation funds. So in the back of the museum, we do a lot of uh, programming. Um, this is a co-sponsored walk in the back in Vineyard Field with Eastern Long Island Audubon Society. And we do this several times a year with them. This, I believe, is a meadows and grasslands walk that we did with them. And I think we were probably looking for maybe like an indigo bunting or something on that particular day. Uh, indigo buntings is one of the, this area is a great breeding ground for indigo buntings, one of the best in all of Long Island. So if you've never seen an indigo bunting before, it's a striking bird, it's blue. And during the spring, when they're migrating and looking for territories to nest in, they start singing, attracting mates, and then they start breeding in the back of the field. So I think I think what we're looking at in this slide is uh, an indigo bunting uh, during one of these co-sponsored walks. There's me holding up a large common snapping turtle. This is another program that we offer um, every each Labor Day, each year uh, during the weekend of Labor Day. We have a big uh, common snapping turtle walk where we set out traps in the Long Pond Green Belt in Coastal Plain Ponds where the snapping turtles exist and live. And we, when the traps are set overnight, this is the result of, of what we catch. And, and it's a very popular walk because we have close to 100 people on this walk. And when they see a common snapping turtle at this size, they're amazed that they even exist in, uh, in, on the South Fork of Long Island. Um, they're very dangerous. Uh, if you're swimming in a pond where there's a large snapping turtle in the water with you, it will not snap at you. It will only snap at you when they're ne looking for nesting sites in June and July. Uh, a lot of times people will see a large snapping turtle female crossing the road and, and will try to help it, but I don't recommend you trying to help it unless you know how to handle one. Um, if you notice on this turtle, the, cap, the, the plastron, which is the lower part of the shell, is very small, and behind it is a large carapace shell. Unlike a box turtle that can hide in its shell, these turtles can. So that's why they've, been, they've evolved to have long necks to snap at predators if they feel vulnerable to getting prey upon. So um, very dangerous uh, when they're on, on the streets looking for nesting sites. They, con they constantly cross from one wetland to another looking for suitable sites. They can travel up to a mile away from their aquatic habitats to lay eggs. And what's really unique is that the temperature of the ground where they lay their eggs determines the sex of the, of the offspring. So if it's a warm environment underground, they will all be females. And if it's a colder environment, they will all be males. Or vice versa. I forget. <laughs> now, do you remember what the, am I right? Is that? I think that. Yeah. Pretty interesting, right? <laughs> Amazing. And this, these are all animals that live here in the South Fork. So. so we do a lot of uh, outreach programming. This is one of our environmental educators, Leah Serafi. She's doing an outreach program at one of the schools. And this is kind of what our mission statement is, is all about, is providing unique connections with children and adults, getting them outdoors, uh, interacting them with some live animals, asking questions, and uh, basically educating the community about the sensitivity of the animals and, and the wildlife that exist here, and then hopefully our objective as an organization is to create the stewardship necessary for the sustainability of the planet and for the sustainability of the wildlife. So if you take away the habitat, you take away the wildlife. You know? So overdevelopment is one reason why we're seeing a depletion in a lot of our reptiles, amphibians, and birds, uh, and insects. So uh, habitat destruction is by far the number one reason why a lot of the animals are in decline and in stress. So we just took on a new initiative last year. Um, four years ago, South Fork Natural History Museum got involved in a shark tagging project, um, tagging sharks off of Long Island South Shore. And 
the group that we were involved in tagged the first uh, juvenile young of the year great white shark in the North Atlantic. And we used a, an archival tag to tag it. Um, and we actually retrieved the tag in Maryland, which gave us data that, it, that the shark migrated south to Maryland. And we were able to um, open up the doors for another organization to come and help us, known as O-Search, the conservation group O-Search. They came and tagged another 21 juvenile great white sharks in the two years after we tagged the first North Atlantic white shark, juvenile white shark. So the South Shore Long Island has been deemed a uh, nursery for juvenile white sharks now. And there, there's a lot of them around. So if you're, if you're swimming in the beaches, you're swimming with juvenile great white sharks. Not adults, juvenile great white sharks. And they're only there to uh, take advantage of the, the fin fish, the mackerel, the bunker, the herring, uh, all the, the small fin fish that they need to, to feed on to develop to the next stage in their life cycle. It takes about 16 to 20 years for a juvenile white shark to be reproductively mature. And we know that from the tagging and the technology that's available now to know a little bit more about the ecology patterns and, and the life cycle of these predatory fish. And they're so important to the ecosystem because without predatory fish as balance keepers and, the, and, 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 and predators to a certain ecosystem, if you, they're keystone species, so if you lose them, the ecosystem decline. So I can say, I, I can say as an observer that the oceans are very healthy at the moment. There's a lot of big fish out there, there's whales, there's dolphins, there's predatory sharks out there. And uh, I hope to believe that part of that is due to conservation efforts, which I believe they are. So that's kind of a, a, a nice thing. It's rewarding for people in my position who are educators, but also to be involved in this project is very rewarding as well. So with that, and uh, SOFO now taking the, the lead on this project, after O-Search has left the South Fork Natural History Museum now, is the lead organization in continuing this important research project. And we were able to create a new shark exhibit on the lower level of the museum. It's an interactive touchscreen exhibit, and there's a wealth of information for children and adults to interact with the, uh, with the program and learn a lot about the work that we're doing, but most importantly about you know the ecology of the sharks that exist in our waters. Uh, we're focusing on white sharks, dusky sharks, thresher sharks, and sand sharks. So there's a lot more work to be done. The more data that we can collect, the more information we'll obtain, and the more uh, of a story and more of a, you know of an idea uh, that we can have to inform. Uh, conservation managers to, to do the right thing in the future to sustain these populations. All right, any questions about the museum? Has any, how many of you have been to the museum? All right, so a little, a little less than half, all right. Well, this, the free day passes allow you to come free of charge for up to six individuals, so I encourage you to, to come and visit. So Where is it? It's uh, right across from the Children's Museum on the Bridgehampton Saga Upper Turnpike in Bridgehampton. Mm -hmm. oh. If anybody knows where the children are, <coughs> we're right across the street from there. What year did you take over the winery? Uh, we bought the property in 1999. So it took uh, six years for the renovation and all the work to be done to create the museum. And now we're entering our, I guess, 12th year, 13th year at this site. But we've been nature educating as an organization for 30 years. This is our 30th year as a nature education organization. So. Very proud to be part of this uh, this endeavor here. It's a pretty special place. Okay, birds, winter visitors. Here's the uh, focus of our talk today. Um, these birds that I'm going to be discussing now are all here at this particular time. They're they're winter birds. Um, they're here just temporarily. Um, they're from the Arctic tundra. They're from the Canadian Maritimes. They're from lakes and rivers up north from the boreal forest. So one of our most popular visitors in the winter is the, is the snowy owl, which there are a couple around now. Uh, at the Shinnecock Inlet and the Dune Road at Shinnecock, there's, there's a couple that are there leading all the way down to Cupsaw County Park. So if you drive along Dune Road or Meadow Lane on the east side, if you see a white plastic bag in the marsh, Make sure you get your binoculars out and look thoroughly because it could be a, a snowy owl. Uh, snowy owls are the second largest bird in the United States, the largest bird uh, 
uh, owl uh, is the great gray owl, which I have never seen in my life. About 30 years ago, there was one that wintered in Lloyd Neck Harbor uh, when I was told. Very rare occurrence, very uncommon. But snowy owls visit us every year. Um, so this one here is a juvenile because of the barred uh, breasts. You see all the bars on it. That indicates that it's either a juvenile or a female. Um, an adult male will be completely all white. Uh, which we've had here on Long Island, but the majority of the snowy owls that visit us here each winter are either juveniles or, or females. Uh, a few years ago, we had a big eruption here where we had a few hundred, actually, that visit us here in the South Pole. And the reason for that is their main food source up in the Arctic tundra are lemons, which is a small rodent. That year that we had that huge eruption, there was a large influx of lemmings that occurred up in the Arctic <coughs> country, and that created um, a lot more, a larger clutch size for the, for, the, for the reproductive mature owls, so they had more young that particular year, and it's usually the young that erupt and come into our habitat during the winter months. Uh, they're diurnal, which means they're not nocturnal like other owls that we know here on the South Fork. They're diurnal because up in the Arctic tundra, they feed uh, in the summer months and nest in the summer months where it's daylight, 24 hours a day up there. And then they come here and they feed during the day and they're active during the day, so it gives us a better chance to see them when we're looking for them uh, during bird walks or if you're just cruising down a dune road, you can probably see one actively hunting or just perched looking for food uh, during the day. Um, this is a snow bunting also from the Arctic tundra. They're like little finches, they come and they feed on little seeds and insects on the ground. Also, they, they are in the same habitat as snowy owls, so they like that tundra environment where there's no trees. Uh, it's all just dunes and, and salt marshes where there's no shrubs, so that's their habitat as well as the snow bunting. Uh, there's a flock of about 100 or so that are on Dune Road now. Uh, Dune Road where? Dune Road over the Palm Park Bridge in Hampton Bays. It's, um, it's Dune Road, Hampton Bays, that goes west all the way into West Hampton. So if you're cruising down Dune Road looking for the snowy owl, and you see a flock of small little finches in the air flying by, it's a good chance they could be so um, And they're only here temporarily, like the snowy owls. They'll defeat the males, will leave two or three weeks before the breeding season to establish nesting sites in rocky crevices up in the Arctic tundra, and then the females will follow a few weeks after. Site to see, you see, you can see them. They won't be here after March, they'll be up in the Arctic uh, doing their thing breeding. Here's a short eared owl. Uh, short eared owls like salt marshes and grassland habitats. Uh, Epcal, which is the Enterprise Park at Colleton, which is just west of Riverhead. Um, there's actually a short eared owl that's been sighted there the last few weeks. And there used to be a lot more grasslands on Long Island, and there was a historical record of short eared owls breeding here at one time. Uh, but without the grasslands and development over our grasslands, the short eared owl hasn't bred here in many years. So, what you can see at, at Epcal Enterprise Park is the last remaining grasslands where these guys winter, and then they'll leave and, and breed up north as well. Did you have any other questions? I think I saw a hand up here. No, no questions? Sure, it out. Uh, it's a little. It's about the size of a great horned owl, which is a little smaller than the snowy owl that we have in display here. It's smaller than that. It has about a three wing, three foot wingspan, and they're they're crepuscular, which means they come out during the twilight hours, which means they basically come out at dawn or at dusk. They don't they don't hunt in the evenings or they don't hunt them in the street, they, they're twilight hunters. So if we were to go look for one, we would go either first thing in the morning before the sun comes up, or last, you know, as the sun sets, it's a good time to see them come out and start hunting. Could you just say the name of that owl again? Short-eared owl. Short-eared We also have long-eared owls in here. I don't have a picture of it, but long-eared owls come too from the memorial forest up north in the country here. And all these birds come here for feeding purposes. They basically come here to take advantage of the voles and moles and the mice that come out at night as well. And they come out and feed on those on that uh, 
source. Mm -hmm. And then they go back up north for breeding purposes. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 That's a male. Okay. Now, do they look different yeah, in the winter time? Yeah, the, bre the, the, the plumage of the, of the male in breeding season is a lot more colorful than this. This is the color that you would see at this time of year. You know. So as it starts to breed and get closer to the breeding season, this plumage will change to a nicer dark black color. Okay. See the gray? Well, that, that actually gets a little darker, but the gray on the back of, his, on the, back of the bird gets a lot darker. They have a small little big size for like American goldfish. Same size. Same size, but, but the color. It's different, yeah. The, female, the males usually provide the different the brighter colors during the breeding season because they're trying to attract the female. The female's female plume just changes as well, they're not as bright as the males do. In, in this, in the still month. Victoria owls don't change much in their plumage during the breeding season. Snowy owls don't change much. You know, when owls are reproductively mature, they uh, they don't have a lot of this more field noise. They're mostly all white. So when you see an all white snowy owl, it's an adult reproductively mature adult. What you see, which you normally don't see during the winter. It's usually juveniles and the They're stubborn. They, they come down. And and sometimes they get caught. Fifty percent of the snowy owls that migrate here in the winter don't make it back because of you know, predation. There's other birds that look to kill them. Uh, there's obstructions, cars. And it's, they go back to the Arctic tundra. It's pretty violent migration. And only theoretically, from scientific reports, only fifty percent make it back to the Arctic tundra. So while they're here, let's see them over here. Uh, American bittern, another bird that historically nested on Long Island. Uh, we used to have a lot more cattail habitats here on Long Island, and a lot of our cattail habitats have been developed on. So you, you take away the habitat, you take away the breeding uh, opportunities for this bird. This bird is a winter bird. It comes here to feed in the shallow creeks of uh, Shinnecock and, and salt marsh habitats. Um, but if, they, if they're here, for, for over the winter, when things start to freeze, they can starve to death because the food source will not be there in the shallow creeks because they would be all frozen at the time. If it gets too cold. Um, I saw one the other day, and he didn't look too good after that polar vortex came through. All the you know the, the tidal pools where the, the killifish and all the freshwater ponds where they feed on tadpoles and other other freshwater fish, all that habitat was frozen. So. He has no food source and he didn't look so good. I hope now with the warm weather things have thawed out and he's able to feed again. Take a ride back there and see. Yeah. This here is a, a marsh hawk, also known as a northern harrier. This is a male, pale male, it's gray. The females are more brown and the juveniles are brown. But what's really distinctive about this bird is you see it has a white rump on the back of the tail. So um, it usually uh, hovers over salt marsh habitats and grasslands. We see them sometimes behind the museum in the Weaver Field. Um, but you can also see them uh, pretty common this time of year. Uh, they're at Dune Road in Chickaw, uh, South Hampton. It's pretty popular and common bird this time of year. They used to breed here too, but uh, they don't breed here anymore. Uh, just quickly, why birds, uh, how birds migrate. To Long Island, there's four different migratory pathways. The one that we are familiar with is the Atlantic Flyway, uh, and then west of that is the Mississippi, the Central, and the Pacific Flyway. And all different birds, or, you know, diversity of birds, utilize these different pathways based on uh, food resources. So, like along the, sh the coastline here, a lot of the birds that migrate along the coastline feed uh, on animals and insects. Fin, fin fish that are close to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, in the Mississippi, uh, they feed on grasslands uh, in different, different habitats that are uh, related to the Mississippi Flyway. Uh, the Central Flyway is, is mostly like rocky mountains and, and the Pacific Flyway more mountainous uh, habitats where they can stop and feed them or their, their migration. Uh, if you notice, a lot of the wildlife refugees, uh, refugees in, 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 North, in North America are all pretty much along the flyways sort of birds during their migration. Uh, 
take advantage of those refugees, refugees and utilize those open spaces over to gain the energy to migrate hundreds and thousands of miles to their nesting grounds if they had more to over there. We had two uh, seasons, two migration seasons. There's the spring migration, which is going to be occurring in a few weeks, uh, maybe a month and a half or so. Uh, and that's a, a migration that is an urge to get to their, their nesting sites. So there's an urge and a need to get to a location a lot quicker during spring migration to establish nesting sites and mating, uh, and mating exercises. In the fall, it's more of a leisurely migration. Starting in September, October, the birds are now done with their breeding up north and they're slowly working their way down south to their wintering grounds. But there's no urge to head south as it is in the spring because they're just basically feeding and not looking for nesting sites or being territorial for, uh, for, for established nesting, uh, nesting sites. So the spring migration is usually during the month of May. First year in the, in the eastern seaboard, we kind of schedule our migratory walks during that time because that's when the birds are most abundant and are heading up to their northern breeding grounds. Uh, and then we go to the fall. And Alex, when I just heard the purple martins are now back in the United States, working their way back up to the South Pole Island. Is so, that a sign that spring's right around the corner? <laughs> And ospreys will be returning, as we know, in, uh, in mid-March. So that's always a nice sign of spring as well. So. Any questions before I move on to the next slide? Yeah. Where do ospreys go in the winter? Just down south, they follow the fish because they're primarily fish eaters. Mm -hmm. So they follow the fish. During the winter months, they have to leave because they, there's no fish availability for them to feed on. So they head down to the Carolinas, down to Florida, even down to the Caribbean and South America in some cases. So they're long treks for them to, to migrate. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So winter waterfowl, these are the word, these are the birds that we're focusing on this time of year. Uh, we just completed our winter waterfowl survey for the New York State Ornithological Association, and I'm the regional compiler for that, and my coverage space is from Shinnecock Canal all the way to Montauk. So there's a lot of you know, waterfowl occupying, occupying areas that we need to cover. So we form teams and we cover that, uh, that area in one day and we do a census on, on winter waterfowl. So these are just some pictures of uh, some birds that are here uh, this time of year. We have northern shovelers, which are Lake Agawam. Uh, these guys are just here temporarily just for the winter. They are vortex feeders, which means they um, create a vortex by swimming around in a circle, bringing up food from the bottom, um, and they pick away at insects and different vegetation that comes up from the bottom as they stir the water. Uh, pretty cool looking bird. They're called shovelers because of their beak. Kind of looks like a shovel. It's kind of pretty large and wide. Uh, this is a common golden eye. Very beautiful bird. Used to be very common, but is now not as common as it used to be. But these are, these are here also in our uh, brackish environments, which is estuary waters, which is a mixture of salt and fresh water. They like that habitat. Uh, here are common eiders. There's a male here and a female here. The majority of uh, the birds that you see at, at Montauk State Park at the point are mostly common eiders and scoters. There are three uh, variety of scoters that visit us. This is a surf scoter. And then we also have black scoters and white wing scoters that come down from uh, Canada to winter here as well. And all of these birds um, actually start pairing up in preparation for the breeding season. So when they're here this time of year, they're actually pairing up to head up north to breed uh, when they migrate up north uh, to find nesting sites. Uh, this is a hooded merganser, beautiful male hooded, hooded merganser. I've seen them in Lake Agawam. I didn't see any today when I just took a quick ride over there. Um, this is long-tailed duck, um, aka old school. Uh, they don't call it old school anymore. Um, they call it long tail. This is the male here. This is the female. Uh, Ten years ago, um, doing surveys for the waterfowl count, I used to see many more of these birds in, in, the, in our waters, and I don't see many of them anymore. And that could be a reflection of different migratory patterns that they've taken because water temperatures are changing, climate is changing. Um, up north, 
you know, where they usually migrate south are not as cold as they used to be. Uh, so they don't need to trek as far uh, to come here for the winter and find a food source. They basically stay up there. And the risk reward for that by staying and not migrating south is you're already at your nesting, uh, you know, your, your breeding site, and you don't have to rush up there uh, in the spring to, to be territorial and, and, and fight with other, other birds for nesting sites. Uh, just like herons here, great blue herons, a lot of them stick around during the winter and they're supposed to be migrating because they also take advantage of shallow creeks and ponds to feed in, but once they get frozen, they lose that food source and they starve to death, actually. So it's a tough, it's a tough situation for a lot of these migratory birds. You either take the risk of sticking around or you, you go and, and follow your, your friends down south and, and enjoy the the winter in the warm environment and then, and then migrate north in the spring. Uh, this is a ruddy duck. Used to be a lot, a lot of rafts of ruddy duck back in the day. Uh, they're also, their numbers are, are declining. But this is a beautiful bird because as it approaches breeding season, the bills of the males start turning blue. Um, and they're gorgeous birds and they're here this time of year, but not in the numbers that they used to be. Uh, this is a lesser scop. We have greater and lesser scop. Uh, in our in our waters here on the South Fork. Lesser scop primarily like freshwater ponds more than saltwater habitats. Greater scop more, more are in, um, in saltwater habitats. This is a lesser scop. They look very similar, um, except there's just a difference in, in, the, in the shape of the head from a, a greater and lesser. I didn't want to get another uh, picture to compare because then we'd be here all day trying to compare the different plumages and females and males. And, and that's one of the great things about birding is it's challenging, you know, these birds are always changing, the females look different than the males, and, you know, they're here certain times a year, and they're not, and it becomes very challenging lifestyle, I call it, not a hobby, it's a lifestyle, because it gets you outdoors, it's very healthy, and it's, it's challenging to, to identify these birds. This bird here, I just saw a bunch of them the other day in Mill Pond, which I was ecstatic about, these are canvasback, and they used to be here in big numbers, and they declined, over the years and to see them not coming back because things just change year after year this could be just a cyclical thing where they're just here in pretty good numbers um, but it was just great to see them a flock I think of about 30 of them I saw in Mill Pond which they're striking and they're gorgeous yeah you can also see them in Big Fresh Pond Big, Big Fresh is what you said yeah you can see them in there too yeah freshwater habitat is where you'll see them they can also be mixed in with uh, redheads too. The people com uh, confuse redheads to canvasback. There are some redheads also in Mill Pond. Uh, this is a red-breasted merganser. There's the male here with the dark head and the female to the right. Um, so a lot of people, you know, won't won't recognize that this is the same species because they look different. The genders look different um, during the breeding season and during the, the winter season as well. But then there are also many other type of winter waterfowl that are here. There are pied billed grebes and horned grebes and um, different types of scoters, loons. Uh, we have sometimes a co uncommon king eider that's mixed in with the common eider. So if you're birding, it's really important to take the time and pick through the flock of birds because you just never know what can be mixed in with the flock. You have a question? I have a question. So you said that some birds decide to Mm -hmm. and some birds decide to migrate mm -hmm. to the warmer climate. So what makes the bird decide to stay? Or Stubbornness, stay? juvenile. Most of the birds that but stick around during... Conscious choice? Pre mean, pretty much. Until they're reproductively mature in adults, that inner instinct to migrate um, and not take the risk to breed doesn't take effect until they're adults. So it's mostly the juveniles that, 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 that risk that risk coming down. Some also that are almost at reproductive maturity will stick around and, and take that risk as well because they're stubborn, just like children are. You know, <laughs> that's the that's the risk that they take by sticking around. You know, so there was another question here. Do they ever uh, mate with other species or no? Uh, duck, ducks sometimes do. There's hybrid ducks, mallards, uh, hy hybridize with other ducks. Um, but yeah, there there are there are some ducks that are hybrid that are hard to distinguish whether they're true mallards or black duck. Black duck's are hybridized as well. 
um, some Canada geese that hybridize with other geese. So yeah, there is that there is that factor involved too. So we also have winter geese besides waterfowl. Winter, besides the winter waterfowl, part of the group of winter waterfowl are winter, are winter geese. Are common Canada geese, which are here year round, but a lot of them do migrate from Canada, and they come here and start pairing up, and then leave uh, during spring migration. Have their young up north, but a lot of the year round ones have their young here as well. We've seen many offspring of Canada geese here throughout the year, especially in the summer when they're developing and they're basically feeding in ponds and grasslands a lot of the young they cut they have about six to, to eight young but during that development season a lot of the young deplete de 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 because they are preyed upon by foxes and and other birds of prey like great horned owls uh, so when you see a, a clutch of young of six to eight with with the, with their parents and you keep an eye on them like we have in the back of our museum they dwindle down to like two by the end of the summer so that's nature, though. That's nature's way of balancing out the, uh, the ecosystem. Uh, this here is a great, greater white-fronted goose, which is uncommon, but you see them year, every year here. They kind of stick around in, in Canada geese flocks. I believe there is a greater white-fronted now in the Riverhead area, in the farm fields in Riverhead, the side farms. Um, sometimes you'll see them in Amagansett and in Montauk, but I haven't heard of any being seen this year out, out east here. Uh, this is snow goose. Uh, every year snow geese come down from a different migratory pathway and intermix with, uh, with our Canada geese. So I have seen several snow goose this year and you can see them in the Bridgehampton area with all the Canada geese over at Shorts Pond off of Scudahole Road. If you look in the pond, if it's thawed out and there's open water, that's usually a good place to see snow geese. Uh, this guy is here is a Greenland goose that you don't see that often, but it does come here periodically in the winter. This is a barnacle goose. Um, it's from way up in the Arctic and Greenland and Iceland. It's a common bird up there, but once in a while these birds accidentally migrate with other birds and they, they show up here and it's a treat for birders you know, to see this bird because it's uncommon and it's kind of a specialty bird to see during the winter months. Anybody guess what this is? What kind of a goose this is? Look at the feet. Pink-footed goose, right? <laughs> Pretty uncommon, but also uh, mixes in like the barnacle goose with Canada geese, and that's a, that's also a bird that was here earlier this winter in the sod farms in Riverhead, and I'm not sure if it's still there. It might be, um, but they they stand out more than the greater white-fronted and the barnacle when they're in the flocks of hundreds and hundreds of Canada geese because of the feet. You know, their feet really give them away, and it's really bright pink. It's pretty cool to check it out. Uh, we have here, I believe that's a tr um, that's a tundra swan. So that's a tundra swan, and there's a tundra swan in Hook Pond in East Hampton now. Every year there's a tundra swan in Hook Pond, mixed in with the mute swans, which I don't have here. Mute swans are year-round swans. Um, but once in a while, every year, we'll get one or two or three uh, tundra swans or Is trumpeter that, swans. These a are swan, trumpeters. A swan, of course. Yeah, they're part of the goose family, yeah. Yep, um, and they're also part of the waterfowl family. Yep. So these birds are different from the mute swans that, we're, that we see most, uh, mostly here on the South Fork of Long Island. Mute swans were introduced back in the 1800s as an ornamental bird for, back, for people's ponds in their backyards. And they basically just uh, naturalized and have basically taken over, or not taken over, but have Paul Long Island home now, and out of the 2,500 breeding pairs in New York State of mute swans, half of them, if not three quarters of them, breed on Long Island. And basically, they displace a lot of our native geese and swans that are that look for food and like to nest and and, and pull home in the same habitat as mute swans. So we don't see we don't see the tundra and trumpeter swans anymore like we used to years ago. I'm talking like 1,500 years ago. Question. Yeah, there was some way to eradicate them by shooting them. <laughs> they used to shake the eggs to kill the embryos, and then the mute swans used to lay on the eggs, but the embryos wouldn't develop as a way to manage the population. 
but that also was looked at as inhumane by wildlife defenders and conservation. So, yeah, I don't, I don't agree with that eradication plan. Um, one thing that people don't realize is that mute swans do displace native wild waterfowl because they're aggressive. They're called mute swans because they can't quack. So their way of uh, being territorial is by hissing and also spreading out their wings. Their six foot wingspans to drive out other birds and that'll do it. That'll drive out the native waterfowl that wants to share the, the food resource in these freshwater ponds and they get driven out, they get flushed out from the mute swans. So that, that's, a, that's one reason why I think a lot of people want to eradicate uh, mute swans from the area because they're displacing a lot of our native birds. Um, what is this guy? Oh, Ross's goose. Yeah, he's rare. And uh, they usually show up in like Riverhead, but we've been seeing more of them now. And the reason being that we're seeing more of them is because all wildlife looks to expand their range. They look to move on to another area to, to have offspring, to get away from their competition of the same species. This is normal, this is nature. And with them adapting to the climate and the habitat here on Long Island, every year we're seeing more and more losses geese showing up. So this, this could be a year-round uh, breeder here in the near future. Um, you know, the time will tell, we'll see. Um, Brant, we're seeing more Brant. It's part of the Canada goose family. They look very similar in some way, but they're a little smaller. You see a lot of them in Western Long Island Sound because they like to eat ulva, which is sea lettuce. It's a marine macro algae. And uh, they're associated with nitrogen loading into water bodies because nitrogen loading is a, um, a nutrient for algae growth. And Western Long Island Sound being so overdeveloped and raw sewage going into that water body creates nutrient um, availability for algae to grow and brant are all over the Western, Western Long Island Sound because of the ulva that, that's growing there and the entomorpha, which is another green algae um, that's associated to um, nitrogen loading and a nutrient rich uh, water body. So we're seeing a little bit more of this on the South Fork of Long Island, which could be an indication that our bays might be a little bit more polluted than they were in the past. That still is something that needs to be looked at by scientists to determine whether that's the case or not. Um, but anyway, it's a gorgeous bird, and uh, there's a nice flock of them right now in Shinnecock Bay. They're beautiful to look at. Um, and again, they're either going to be here year-round or, or migrate uh, in the next few weeks to, or within the next month and a half or so. Uh, these are more familiar backyard birds that we see at our feeders. Uh, we have a feeder at the museum, and it's a, it's a treat to see these birds come and go from our feeders. Um, just, just gorgeous looking birds like this downy woodpecker. Um, there's also a bird that looks very similar to this. It's a little larger, known as a hairy woodpecker. Um, but this is a male with the, with the red spot on its head. And the females don't have that red spot, but they look very similar. They have small little beaks. The hairy woodpeckers are a little larger than this with longer beaks. That's a field mark uh, that identifies and distinguishes between the two birds. Uh, this is a dark-eyed junco. This is a winter bird that just comes in the winter. Uh, they're seed feeders. So they love the bird feeders, you know, you see them all around, there are tons of them around behind the museum and all around the South Fork now. They'll be leaving soon to uh, migrate north and, uh, you know, start their nesting and, and breeding uh, practices. This is a red-bellied woodpecker, um, very common bird, year-round bird, but this is another bird that you see in your backyard. If you have a feeder or some water bath where they can go in and drink, you know, or take a bath, this is a bird that you would see. In, you know your backyard is pretty common. The typical blue jay, if anybody doesn't realize how beautiful this bird is, because there's so many of them, but if you were to analyze it through scope or binoculars, it's a striking bird. I think it gets overlooked because it's just so common. But that bird is so beautiful, and it's a year-round bird. Most of the blue jays that we see this time of year are not the year-round resident birds that we have during the summer. A lot of the blue jays that we see this time of year are birds from up north that come here and stay here for the winter. And then the ones that we have here all summer long are probably down in Jersey or the Carolinas. And then they come up, you know, and have their inbreeding. Yeah. 
smart bird. Yeah, no, they're very intelligent. These birds are very, very smart. Black capped chickadee, we all see them. They're year round birds. Uh, they're very common around our feeders and backyards. Tufted titmice, tufted titmouse. They just started doing their spring call yesterday, the day before we had the warm weather. I heard different calls from the titmouse that were more uh, spring calling, so they're starting to feel the change in season, and their first thing they do, their first reaction is to start calling for mates, you know, and uh, start establishing territory for, for nesting purposes. Um, so yeah, so the, the calls are starting slowly. Northern Cardinal this morning was doing his Northern Cardinal breeding call, which was very nice to hear. More backyard birds, we have American goldfinch, common to our uh, Feeders, we usually use, uh, what's it called, the, uh, the mixed seed. Uh, thistle feed, thank you, yeah. Thistle feed, which is primarily the food uh, that both American goldfish like. Uh, Northern Cardinal, the male to the right, female to the left. Uh, this is a house finch, uh, which is a beautiful bird that we have this time of year. And sometimes they stick around year round. You'll see them in the summer as well. They breed here on the island. Uh, this here is a song sparrow, year round bird. When they start calling in the spring, it's fabulous call. Their song is amazing. I haven't heard anyone, any song sparrows call yet, but they're around our backyards now, around the museum, just uh, feeding on wherever they can back there. This is a, a fox sparrow. Um, it's not really rare, but it's uncommon to see, but we see them in the back of the museum. They're mixed in with the white-throated sparrows and the song sparrows. They also feed on uh, the seeds that fall from the feeders, and. And they usually are brown feeders more than going up on the on the feeders and feeding directly from the uh, from the seed. This here is our New York State bird, Eastern Bluebirds. They're year round, but a lot of them do migrate south, and then they come back in the spring. And uh, they're cavity nesters, so they look for for bluebird boxes or holes in cavities, you know, cavities in trees to nest in. Um, so just to give you an idea that you know, bluebirds are so relied on woodpeckers to start the holes on trees so that the bluebirds can find the holes and basically grind them down to the size that, that is adequate for them to have a cavity nest. So if we lose woodpeckers, we're going to lose all the other cavity nesting birds that rely on woodpeckers to, to start the, the, the cavity holes. Um, Eastern screech owls that are resident birds too also are cavity nesters and they rely on woodpeckers too to start the holes. No, they do it to look for insects in the trees. They, they feed on insects in the trees, so they peck away at the, on the bark of trees to try to find insects. And then the holes that are made from the woodpeckers are then utilized by other birds, tree swallows, purple martins, eastern screech owls, bluebirds. So those are, those are birds that rely on, on woodpeckers. So if you cut down the trees, you take away the woodpeckers, opportunity to feed, but then you also take away the opportunity for cavity nesting birds to, to nest properly. And um, so that's why there's handmade bird boxes that we, that we put up to help these uh, cavity nesting birds for, for reproduction purposes. The South Fork Natural History Museum has 160 bluebird boxes throughout the South Fork. And they're monitored by a volunteer, Joe Jenta, who's our bluebird box monitor. He goes out twice a year and checks every bird box and reports and gets collects the data to see if it's you know if we need to move the boxes or do we need to add more. Um, unfortunately, just like I said earlier, all wildlife looks to expand their range. We're now getting we're having a problem with southern flying squirrels that fly and glide to bluebird boxes and eat adults and the young and the eggs. So southern flying squirrels are, are invasive and are non-native invasive, which means now we have to take the precautions to move the boxes away from woodlands, which they once were, and move them away from the, from the, from the forest so that the flying squirrels don't intervene with the, from down south. Yeah, I mean, they just, they just look to expand their range, just like all natural wildlife does. You know, southern pine beetles now are here, and they're killing a lot of our pine trees. They're just, moving and adapting to this environment because there's changes in the environment where our winters are not like the winters we had years ago, which would kill off these these squirrels and these southern pine beetles. They would basically die from cold winters, but we're not getting those cold winters like, like we used to. So they're just adapting and, and living here. Is there anything you can do to avoid 
Just don't put feeders out. That's it. <laughs> traps. You know, but I don't encourage traps. You know, it's the fear. We have we have a rat Norway rat problem. Not a problem, but there's Norway rats at the museum because they're looking to, to feed as well. You know, they're looking to survive the winter. And if there's accessibility to feed on droppings from the feeders as the birds are feeding on, they're gonna they're gonna do what they need to do to survive. Yeah, the only way I would say to, to eradicate, you know, mice and, and rats from, from your backyard with feeders is not put the feeders out. You know, that's it's the problem. Not a I know, I know. It's yeah. There's that's the only solution I have, or or traps. You know. You know, squirrel. I used to have squirrels coming to my house, and they would literally fly. That's what it means, a flying squirrel. Southern flying squirrels. If you see one, they're not. They don't fly. They soar. They don't have like wings. So they basically jump from the tree and they soar like 50, 60 feet to to a to a structure to feed on, like a like a bluebird box or another tree. They don't like to be on the ground because then they, have, they feel vulnerable to being preyed upon by a predator. So if you can move the box as far as far away from the woods where they're not going to glide towards that box, they're not going to glide towards it because they're going to fall on the ground first and they're not going to like that. So we've already moved a lot of our bluebird boxes from from the woodland areas uh, at the East Tampa Airport where we have 50 boxes. Am I running out of time? Well, uh, you're not out of time. It's just if you want to take a walk, I hope some of you know. Yeah, we'll see. I just got a few more slides yeah. than we done. So did I go through all these birds? Yeah. All right, so. Um, so how do birds survive the winter? Here's a picture of tree swallows that are all just cuddled up on a branch. And they're basically just taking advantage of their body heat and cuddling up. And that's one adaptive way that birds survive. Um, but shivering, um, I, I think the font's a little too small for everybody to read, so I'm just going to read what the, what the copy is on this slide. So uh, just like people, birds shiver to stay warm. Birds have much higher metabolic rates and burn more energy to stay warm than we do. Black-capped chickadees weigh less than half an ounce and can maintain a body temperature of 100 degrees Fahrenheit even when the air is zero degrees. They do this by having great insulation, being very active, and remembering where they store their food. A steady supply of food is essential because chickadees eat more than 35% of their weight every day. Compared to many other birds, chickadees have a large hippocampus, the part of the brain that's responsible for spatial memory. In the fall, and as we approach winter, this part of their brain gets even bigger. So they adapt by having larger space in their brains to know where, where they left their food. Um, and shivering is a way to keep warm. You know, when you see a bird shivering, it's basically just adapting to the environment. And uh, it's just a, one way of, of staying warm and surviving the harsh winters that used to occur here. Uh, that, bulb, that polar vortex that we had a couple of last week was just temporary. You know, these birds can survive that, no problem. If it sustains to be, you know, lingers for a longer period of time, then they're going to have to rely on where they, where their food supply was stored to survive. And it's not, it's not the weather that determines whether they survive or not. It's food source. They can survive in minus 30 degree weather most of the time. It's, a, it's just the availability of food that will enable them to survive or not. In under leaves, in trees. You know, but they remember where, you know, and they hide it from other birds, so it's very, very isolated, very, very hidden. Fluffing feathers is another way, I, I think the font is a little too small for everybody to read, so I'll read it again. Uh, weather fat, fur, or feathers, insulation matters for most cold weather animals. Old, cold climate birds pack on body weight in late summer and fall in anticipation of the long, cold winter, but feathers also play an important role. All birds stay warm by trapping pockets of air around their bodies. The secret to maintaining these layers of air lies in having clean, dry, and flexible feathers. The cleaning process, generally known as preening, depends on the species of bird. While all birds produce a special oil from a gland near the base of their tails, some cold, tolerant birds use this oil to weatherproof their feathers. Other birds, like egrets, herons, and morning doves, grow special feathers that disintegrate, that dis that disintegrate into powder that they use to waterproof their feathers. Regardless of water waterproofing method they use, preening helps birds keep a water resistant top layer and a toasty warm inner layer. So here's a, a short-eared owl and a blue 
blue jay uh, basically fluffing their feathers to stay warm. Um, they have a gland behind in, the, in their back tail that has an oil that they secrete from that gland that actually they can take out and basically cover a lot of their feathers to, to create this insulation and, and waterproof um, way of, to survive the winter. So it's pre they're pretty unique. They've evolved to, to, to survive these cold winters in this way. Any questions about fluffing feathers? You see that often. A lot of people are like, oh, my, my American robins in my backyard are a lot bigger this time of year. Why is that? Well, because they have a lot more feathers now this time of year to, to survive the winter. They think it's different birds. They're like, I have this orange bird in the back. I don't know where it is. Roosting and cuddling. This is the, the, the picture that we saw at the beginning of the, of the ways that they survive. So similar to people. Uh, the way we cuddle for warmth, small birds like tree swallows crowd together, crowd together in shrubs, vines, and evergreen trees to share body heat. They can also slow down their metabolic rate to conserve energy. Cavity, nesting, cavity nesters like nuthatches, titmice, and downy woodpeckers use tree cavities and nest boxes to stay warm. Cavities and boxes provide protection from the weather and help birds hide from predators. Larger birds like American crows and ring-billed gulls are also known to flock together for warmth. So sometimes you'll see a bunch of uh, uh, American crows all on a, on a, a wire kind of have, hanging out, that, and tree swallows. Tree swallows are gone now. They're insectivores, so you won't see them this time of year. They're more, more south uh, than, than here on the South Fork of Long Island. So, um, but you know, this is just another way of uh, birds adapting to surviving the winter. Tucking feet and bills. This is common this time of year. We see a lot of birds in the farm fields and along our uh, aquatic habitats. Uh, this is one way they survive. So, uh, waterfowl species circulate blood through, through circulate blood through a countercurrent heat exchange, isolating the blood that flows in their legs rather than circulating it throughout their entire bodies. This helps to keep their body temperatures higher. Birds also have specialized scales on their feet and legs that help them minimize heat loss. Many ducks, geese, pelicans, gulls, and swans further conserve body heat by standing on one leg or even sitting down. The Canada geese pictured here are tucking their bills under their back feathers, keeping their bills warm while also increasing breathing efficiency by utilizing warmer air. So a lot of times during the cold winter months we see waterfowl and geese in the water and you're always wondering, how are they doing that? You know, how are they surviving? Well, that countercurrent heat exchange where you know bloods from their veins, from their feet are are mixing with arterial blood from their arteries, are keeping that cold blood kind of in a balance and and, warm, and keeping their that cold blood warm. So they've adapted and have ways of staying warm. Unlike us, we have to stay at a uh, we have to stay indoors and, and stay warm. Unlike birds that can you know resist this this harsh environment and sustain their their survival. Question about the heat exchange. I thought I saw a hand. No. So bird watching tools. Um, obviously binoculars are, are a very important tool. So these are my these are my binoculars. They're eight by forty two, perfect for bird watching. Uh, the eight and the eight by forty two um, are the um, the magnification of how close you can get to a to an object. Um, so it's eight times magnification than what you would see with the human eye. And the 42 is the, uh, the aperture, the amount of light that enters your binoculars. So these are both 41 millimeters, uh, 21 millimeters equaling 42 millimeters. So that's why it's eight by 42. So these are perfect for bird watching, they're light. Um, the higher magnification you go with binoculars, it becomes a little bit more distorted, more difficult to find, to, to see the actual field marks on birds, like the color, uh, the, the type of feathers that it has, the field marks on the head. Uh, the 8x42 is what I recommend. Uh, spotting scopes uh, to the right. This is our spotting scope. So when, you go, when you go waterfowl watching in the ocean or bay, most of the birds that you're going to be looking at are going to be pretty far offshore. So you're going to need a spotting scope. So spotting scopes can magnify things anywhere from 40 to 60 times more magnification than you would with your binoculars or the human eye. And these are essential when you're looking at birds from afar. So snowy owls, you want to bring a scope to look at a snowy owl. Sometimes that little plastic bag on the 
on a barrier island or, or out in the marsh that you really can't analyze with your uh, binoculars, you'll need the scope to analyze it better and confirm that that's a snowy owl. Um, and also the winter waterfowl. Common eiders, when you see a flock of eiders and you want to look for a cane eider in that flock, spotting scope. Time, patience, and the right instruments is what's going to get you that, uh, that bird. And then on the lower right, we just have a variety of uh, field guides, Peterson's field guides. We have some samples on the table over here. Uh, I always recommend for beginning birders the Peterson's field guide. There's, his system um, actually has uh, points that point to different field marks of the birds, which is very helpful. Um, and then there's advanced field guides, like Sibley's is a little bit more for an advanced birder. But it does, um, you know, by reading that, the Sibley's guide definitely improves a birder's uh, ways of understanding the different field marks, the sizes, um, and distribution uh, of that particular bird. And then there's the National Geographic and Kaufman, there's, there's plenty of other um, bird books. But then now they have the apps now on cell phones, which you don't have, you can use, you don't have to carry a book around to, to look at birds. You just download an app and the field guide is right in the palm of your hands on, in your, on your cell phone, which makes it convenient. So I think that's it for the instruments, and then I think that might be it. Here's some information about how you can contact us and get involved in citizen science surveys and bird programs. Um, so there's our website, uh, also our uh, email and our phone number. And thank you. Thank you. Happy bird. Yeah. I'll take any questions.